Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good. Uh, delighted to see you all this evening on a raw fall evening. And um, I wanted to thank the uh, library trustees for being the uh, co-sponsor of this program and giving us the f facilities. And now I want to turn the program over to uh, Kevin Hanron, who is uh, going to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you, Fred. And welcome to tonight's Wellesley Conservation Council and Wellesley Library educational presentation, Dinosaurs, Dunes, and Drifting Continents, uh, The Amazing Geologic History of Massachusetts. Uh, we'd first like to thank Roach for the Supermarkets and Whole Food Market uh, here in Wellesley for their generous contributions of the apple cider to my right uh, and the donut holes. So thank, thank you to those vendors. Um, the, uh, we'd also like uh, as to uh, thank the uh, Wellesley Free Library and especially its assistant director, Elise, Elise McLennan. And Kathy, okay. I, oh, I did talk to Elise. <laughs> um, all right. So before beginning, I'd like to uh, briefly explain who the Wolsey Conservation Council is, because many of you may not be members and may not really know who we are. We, we are a United States Code 501c3 tax-exempt private land trust organization, not to be confused with the Municipal Natural Resources Commission, although we were one and the same until 1979, oddly enough. Uh, as such, we are dependent on the generous contributions uh, through memberships and donations to be able to proactively manage our properties. And that's a very important uh, message I like to con convey. We don't just sit there and let the trees fall over and we, we cut trails, we manage, we, we cut timber when, when we need to thin. We uh, take care of beaver uh, occupation zones and monitor those carefully. We educate the neighbors that are on or, or that abut our properties. Um, and uh, we are also right now seeking conservation-minded individuals who are not members to consider becoming a member. And you can talk to me or to Fred or to Pete Jones or Michael Tobin here on the left. Uh, just those are the people I see quickly uh, about that. And if you are a member, uh, we are looking for one additional director on the council. So if you feel that you're, you might be interested in, in a uh, more than a uh, you know, a temporary or, or very minimal uh, contribution, then you might want to consider being a director. All righty. Uh, so uh, uh, a couple of extra requests for, for uh, information here. Um, the cups, the, the plastic cups that you're drinking the cider out of are recyclable. So if you, if you can, please put them in the blue recycling bin where Joan is pointing. And, and, and by the way, Joan is also a director and can talk to you about the council as well. Uh, and in addition to the books that, that Richard has on his uh, table here, the council also publishes books. And so we are actually reprinting a new edition of Walks in Wellesley uh, this year uh, to reflect changes in the geography of the town, like the fact that the St. James Church is no longer there. And so on all the maps, we had to change that to the skating complex, which uh, has a far greater attendance, I think, than the poor church to, did at the end. Um, but uh, this book, this reprinting edition, will be available uh, certainly by January in the Wellesley Bookstore. Um, in addition to that, one last thing before I introduce the speaker. Uh, on Sunday, November 10th, from 3 to 4 p.m., uh, the council is uh, hosting an event at Cronk's Rocky Woodland at, at uh, 18 Crown Ridge Road here in Wellesley, and we'll be reheating the cider that we have there. And, <laughs> and hopefully the donuts don't go stale. Uh, but no, we'll have, we'll have hot cider and donuts available at that event as well. So again, that's November, that's Sunday, November 10, 3 to 4.30 p.m., okay? And with that, I will introduce our speaker tonight, Richard, Professor Richard D. Little, and um, there you are, <laughs> okay. And he's come in from East Hampton, Massachusetts, 
he has degrees from Clark University and the University of Southern California. He's, the, he's a geologist and a recognized authority on the geology and the paleontology of the Connecticut River Valley. And he'll explain what those words mean. And, <laughs> and he has brought books that he has published for all of you to review at the conclusion of tonight's event here at the front desk. Uh, Professor Little will now begin his presentation on the dinosaurs, dunes, and drifting continents of the portion of the Earth's land surface that is now called Massachusetts. Uh, so pardon my voice, I hope it holds up tonight, and if I sneeze or cough, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm too contagious. Did you all sign the waiver if you're in the front row? <laughs> so this is a rock that has light and dark layers that you can perhaps see, and if you're uninitiated to geology, you probably think, oh, it's sedimentary because it's got layers, but these are light and dark mineral layers. This is a metamorphic rock, and some of you know what a nice rock this is. That's another one of our geology jokes. <laughs> this rock is nice. That's the G-N-E-I-S-S, -S. nice. So is this a nice rock? Don't you think this rock is nice? We never get tired of that pun. <coughs> Okay, so this is indeed a nice metamorphic rock, but the reason why it is so special and the reason why I keep it in my pocket is because this is a rock that has a fossil fault. Do you see how the layers are offset here? Look at that, they don't quite line up. And so, this rock, this is a fossil earthquake here. So this is a rock that preserves a quake that broke a rock way back in the Earth's early history. Probably this goes back to Mesozoic dinosaur times. And uh, the reason I say that is the rock itself was metamorphosed uh, during the Paleozoic, the early Paleozoic, way before the, uh, the dinosaurs. But the fault could not have happened during the metamorphism because the rock would be too squishy. So the rock had to cool, probably get closer to the surface of the Earth, and then what happened, as you'll see in tonight's show, is that Pangaea, the great supercontinent, broke, and that generated earthquakes all across the region, and that's probably the stress that broke this rock. So anyway, rocks have such a great history, and you just have to know a little bit of geology, or just have a good imagination to tell a good story. All my samples up here tonight, by the way, can be touched. So come on up. If you haven't felt an armored mud ball, for instance, you must feel these. These are really unique. I'll talk about them in the program. And uh, just in case you fall asleep and don't remember what happened, I did write a book about the Connecticut Valley geology, and you can <laughs> pick up one of these guys here. So without further ado, why don't we get started? Just to let you know, there's only 117 slides. And there it is. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if the lighting can go down any, or if you wish the lighting down, but let's go. So this is what we're going <coughs> to, excuse me, this is my voice again, excuse me. <coughs> so tonight, we're going to focus on the history of Wellesley within the context of the Connecticut River Valley, because, you know, that's where I'm from, that's where most of my work is done. So we'll look at Wellesley, however. Where was Wellesley when the plates were moving? What rocks are under Wellesley? What about that problem rock? You all know about the problem rock in Wellesley? How many people don't know about the problem rock? Well, there's a lot of people who don't know about the problem rock. Wow, look at that. You come here and now you learn about more problems. <laughs> so what did the glacier do? And do you have any questions? And let's go on. First of all, geology. Name the three types of rocks. Do you remember these? There's the igneous, there's the metamorphic, and, and the other one. <laughs> Oh, good, we got it right. <laughs> or is it classic <laughs> punk and hard? <laughs> okay, so uh, you can see where Wellesley is there on the right, and you can see that uh, pin over on East Hampton, so that's where I'm from. And this is a neat little spot over here. How many people have been to the Connecticut River Valley in Massachusetts? Wow, good for you, you're a well-traveled group. but. <laughs> Great little valley here with a hockey stick ridge that runs all the way down to New Haven from Amherst to New Haven. 
and we'll talk about that in a bit. So that's the Connecticut Valley, and we're gonna take a look at some comparisons between this area and Wellesley. You get to Wellesley, oh, it's a flat landscape. You got ponds and wetlands and no rivers of any consequence at all. How do you stand to live here? Oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Look at this, this is the Charles River. It doesn't know where to go. It's trying to find its way to the ocean. It goes back and forth and curves around, goes north, it goes south, goes east, <laughs> goes west a bit. Now the Connecticut River Valley, on the other hand, is going to be dominated by the Connecticut River and the Holyoke Range, 400 feet thick of lava from the Mesozoic time, Jurassic with the Connecticut River cutting right through it. So look at that, it's a majestic landscape and a great geological history. In fact, besides Wellesley, I'm gonna present the geohistory of the Connecticut River Valley. And it's the best place in the world to study geology. Um, how is the audio, by the way? Is this like really too loud? Is it okay? All right. So. The Connecticut River Valley is the best place in the world to study geology. So, let's see if I can prove that. Look at what we have across the Connecticut Valley. There's the Holyoke Range, which is the lava flow that I mentioned. We have dinosaur footprints in our sedimentary rock. I brought one here, and um, there's another one on display, too, from uh, Peter. Was this Peter's rock? Anyway. Um, Landforms of the river, and a bed of old Lake Hitchcock right here too. Plus all the three rock types are right across the valley. We've got the sedimentary, the igneous, and metamorphic rocks on either side of the valley. So literally you can walk, uh, okay, give it a day, depending on where you are, but you can walk right across the whole valley and see all of these things. It is just amazing. Oh, there's even a dino, <laughs> well. It's the best place in the world to study geology. So, let's find out more. Oh, there's an advertisement first. You know, I do, uh, I do tours, so I would like to invite anybody to go to Iceland with me next year. We've got a couple spaces left, so how would you like to do that? Sit on a, this, this was July 1st, a few years ago. Sit on an iceberg, on the iceberg beach. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, so we're going to a couple other places also. If this interests you, please sign up on my email list. Uh, you can also get a tour list over here. Just a couple of other things. Some people ask me when I do teaching, and I do a summer institute at for, for just a week at uh, Historic Deerfield. So if you'd like to be part of that, it used to be like a Rhodes Scholar program, but they can't use that name anymore. And they made their own program, and here it is. So if you want to <laughs> investigate that, that's here. And how would you like a free meteorite? Where did that come from? Out of the blue, right? <laughs> but um, I run a gem and mineral show at Greenfield Community College, and if you want to ride out to our wonderful Connecticut Valley, you can get a free meteorite as part of the show. Here's the show flyer right here. That's coming up on November 9th on a Saturday. Okay, so. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, oh yes, I, I have a book that I told you about. I also have these DVDs, if you would like a DVD the, uh, of the Connecticut River Valley and also about our glacial lake, Lake Hitchcock. They're $5 each, look at that, only five bucks for all that history. But there is a special tonight. There are two for 10. <laughs> um, so anyway, this, th <laughs> this is what they look like. Shameless promotion, right? <laughs> Boy, I've gotten so rich out of these publications, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> you know my name, like Rich Little. That oh. my, uh, my, wife, my wife's mother said, well, you've got to marry Rich, and she took it literally. <laughs> so, in any event, um, the German Mineral Show coming up. We have a couple of speakers, including myself and this fellow right here who's a, who collects meteorites. Can you imagine that? His job. He goes around the world, he finds meteorites, goes to the desert in Africa. He has found so many meteorites and he distributes them to museums and does his own um, work on their compositions. So that's Peter Sheriff and he's gonna give out some free ones. Okay, back to the show. So, let's see, where was Wellesley when the tectonic plates collided to make Pangaea? Do you remember Pangaea? Some of you are perhaps old enough for that. Remember those old maps? So, where was Wellesley? Let's start with North America. So here's North America. It's on its side. The equator goes right through the middle of North America. 
the North American continent, that plate is called Laurentia, by the way, and Western Massachusetts and Western Vermont, Lake Champlain, et cetera, that's the shoreline here, that's the location. Where is Wellesley? Well, Wellesley was part of this great southern continent called Gondwana. So particularly for the younger people in the audience, can you say Gondwana? Can you say it louder? Gondwana. I think that's one of the greatest words in the whole geological literature. Gondwana. Where did you go on vacation? Gondwana. Where was Wellesley? Gondwana. That's where it's all started. <coughs> so Wellesley is out here in the ocean south of the equator on a piece of land. It was a piece of land that came from Gondwana, split off somewhere from Gondwana, and then it drifted across the ocean, perhaps 500 miles away, and along with some other pieces, rammed into North America. So this piece and other pieces over the Paleozoic era were ramming into North America, and they were building land, adding, basically adding New England to the shoreline of North America. And so when this happens, there's ocean in the way, in this crust, ocean, there's, um, you know, rocky crust under the ocean, which has to go down out of the way, it's called subduction. Now, how many people have heard of subduction before this very moment? My gosh, that's only one third of the group. This is a great name. <coughs> this ranks right up there with Gondwana, actually. So, subduction. Duction means motion, sub means going down. So, subduction is what's happening here. So, as this continental crust goes towards North America, the ocean crust dives down underneath this. And it creates earthquakes and molten rock. And see the volcanoes up there right next to Wellesley? Yes, they were erupting right around here at this time, roughly 400 million years ago. So, I would like to share the only <laughs> world's <laughs> only subduction joke here. Yes, here we go, see if this works. <laughs> the world's only subduction joke. Well, this is subduction in a totally different context. There's a duck on a pond, the duck dives. Yes, it's subduction. <laughs> okay, actually I think that's a pretty good joke because that's what's happening with the ocean crust. It's diving down, so anyway. It is what it is. So there's Wellesley, there's subduction going on, and it's gonna crash into North America and add a big part to New England. Now, following Wellesley's piece of a uh, small tectonic plate here, we have uh, the big part of uh, Gondwana coming in, and that's gonna crash into North America as you see it there, and we're gonna kinda nestle right up next to North Africa, and that makes the supercontinent of Pangaea. So that's the state of the land before the dinosaurs in the late Paleozoic era. So by the end of the Paleozoic era, about 250 million years ago, Wellesley in New England, that's the view from the library. <coughs> Just look out there across those high mountains. And so, what does a big continental crash do to bedrock? And to illustrate that, I have a dramatic moment for you. Tectonic plate, tectonic plate, crash. <laughs> big change. Okay, you can do this at home. <laughs> so, what did the continental crash do to the bedrock? Well, here's Wellesley. This is the geological map. It got folded, it got faulted. There was metamorphism, the rock changed. You see, metamorphism, heat and pressure changes the rock. Minerals get recrystallized, a little bit of flowage. You get a nice, perhaps. There are igneous intrusions where liquid rock comes through and penetrates the others. And that's what you see here. Now, this looks like a bunch of scribbles perhaps, but these are not roads. <coughs> Each one of these black lines are fault lines, places where rocks have measurably broken and become offset. So you see, this is damaged goods. <laughs> but, and this is a big but here, some sedimentary rocks survive the crash of continents 
And this is absolutely amazing. See, they were kind of ensconced with a whole bunch of granite and metamorphic rocks around them. So when that whole piece came in and crashed into North America, this was like an island of peace, of quiet, that did not get metamorphosed very much. A little bit of metamorphic, but didn't get metamorphosed and changed tremendously. You can still see the sedimentary nature here. And that is the pudding stone that you perhaps all know about. You all know about the Roxbury conglomerate pudding stone, right? It's got pebbles in it. Well, you're going to see it in a minute. But this is the really interesting thing about this, is that with the crashing of the continents, this piece, this part, did not get metamorphosed in the midst of all that collision. You can still see the sedimentary nature of that rock. And so, that's where it is right there. You can see Wellesley, perhaps you can see where Boston is. It goes, it's that brown color. It goes all the way through over towards Boston. Okay, let's look at this uh, in review here. If we re review these Paleozoic events, these pieces that came from elsewhere, that came off of uh, Gondwana, for instance, these are called exotic terrains because they came from someplace else and they moved by tectonic processes, continental drift, shall we say, and they crashed into North America. And what I'm going to show you is kind of a graphic of how that happened. So we're going to take this little slice off of North America, and this is where our continent begins in the early Paleozoic. So that edge here is this edge right there, and this is in the western Berkshire. So you're up at North Adams here. Um, and then what happens next is there's another piece. See, several pieces are going to come and crash into North America. So one is these is called the Shelburne Falls Act arc, one of these pieces. So that's going to crash in, and there's Shelburne Falls up there. And this creates mountains, and it's, they're called orogenies. This is the Taconic orogeny from about 480 million years ago. And now, I would like to educate you here because there's a spelling lesson involved here. There's orogeny with an O versus erogeny with an E. And I would like to point out that uh, the god of love is Eros, and there are various erogenous zones that are mapped out thanks to the internet. And we're not talking about those. We're talking about orogeny, the formation of mountains. And so we have all these mountain types here, and <laughs> many of them are just preserved in New England rocks. So I hope this was helpful. So the Taconic orogeny, here it is. Shelburne Falls, that land crashes into the old edge of North America, builds some mountains, the Taconic Mountains. And then we have another slice that comes in, that's central Massachusetts. This line here is roughly 495. And then we have Wellesley on its little piece called the Avalon Terrain. And that crashes into North America also. And then beyond that, we have Africa, um, the, Ga the Gondwana piece, the big piece that comes in and crashes in next to complete Pangaea. So in the process of doing all this, if we step back and look at the New England geological map, what I'd like to point out is look at these trends. There are lots of long metamorphic bedrock layers. All of these long layers are metamorphic rocks that are all squeezed up. But sometimes there's granite. Now, do you know about granite? It's an old magma chamber. It's a liquid, comes through, it kind of punches and melts its way through, pushes its way through. And so when you see these pinkish areas, like right there and other places, this is where rocks got melted underneath and pushed their way through the metamorphic soup or the ice cream. How about uh, like fudge swirl ice cream, but parts of it melt and so it becomes the granite that pushes into the melted ice cream. Is anyone else getting hungry? <laughs> uh, so, do you see that pattern? Everybody see the pattern? Because this pattern will now be explained. And it's a really interesting and quick and easy explanation and it involves a car crash. Are you ready for this? So, lots of long metamorphic bedrock layers and the granite that pushes through. So, why do we have so many of these? Well, we had Pangaea, we had the squeezing, we had the collision. And I'm going to show you the state of Vermont because that will show this best. By the way, is there any way to turn lights down even lower than this? 
um, uh, just in case it, things show up a little sharper if it's a little darker. And that'll give me time to take a drink. Okay, I wanted to show you the state geological map of Vermont. And you see all those linear up and down layers? How's the view from the back row, by the way? Can you guys see back there? Okay, so you have all these up and down layers oriented north-south. And you see these are the granite layers. See how they kind of push their way through? Boom, coming up through. Okay, now this uh, Vermont map also has cross sections of certain areas across Vermont. And what you see here is there's the granite that's pushing its way in, and then this whole mess gets eroded away so we can see right through the middle of all this. But notice the fault lines. If you see certain fault lines, you notice that the top of the fault is pushed up and over in that direction. And that tells you where the squeezing came from. You see all those folds that indicate squeezing, and you know about the tectonic plate movements, and can you guess that the plate motion came from the right towards the left, from out to sea towards the west, towards the inland, and it just squeezed everything up and broke rocks. Sometimes after the rocks broke and were pushed up and over, one over the other, along the fault lines, there were areas that were hotter than others down below, and that created a dome. So areas that were hotter just pushed their way up, and those are known as domes. So we have domes, and we have folds, and we have faults, all due to these collisional events. It's like being caught in a vice. And now, let's relate this to a car crash, and you can understand the stresses involved. So there's the two cars that have crashed. Now. Compressive stress is involved here, right? One car hits the other. Compression, just like a continent hitting the east coast of the United States. And so you have the folding that's the result of that compression. And as it says here, notice that the folds are perpendicular to the compression. You see that? These are the linear, those are the linear belts of rock that are all metamorphosed. But it tells you if the folds are north-south, it tells you that the stress came in an east-west direction. Okay, isn't that pretty good? And this graphic is even more accurate for this representation because, remember the dome? Look, we got a dome. <laughs> okay, so when you look at New England and Port Wellesley within the context of New England, you're part of this stripiness as well, and it tells you which way the collision that made Pangaea came from. It came from out there to the sea, out there from the east, and crashed in here towards the west, and made our bedrock the way we see it. Okay, so one more important note it was, is, as I said here, that pudding stone that I talked about, which is a sedimentary conglomerate, this is actually Precambrian. It goes back before the Paleozoic era. It's a Precambrian rock. It goes back 600 million years, well before Pangaea was made. And see, that's what makes this so special. Everybody get this point? Because you've all heard about the Roxbury conglomerate, the pudding stone, but that's really old. That's a rock that was sitting here on somewhere in Gondwana before Pangaea, and then when the pieces came and collided with North America, it did not get metamorphosed. It stayed there, still sedimentary with all those nice little pebbles. And my God, there it is. It just appeared. <coughs> it's also the Massachusetts State Rock. <laughs> so, conglomerate, the Roxbury Pudding Stone. Now, did you know this? <coughs> this is a rock that was slightly metamorphosed so that, and it's very old, it's been compressed because it's hung around so long deeper, deeper uh, in the earth. So the pieces hang together. Most conglomerates fall apart. You would not want to build your house out of conglomerate. But this is a building stone, and as it says here, 20 area churches are made out of Roxbury conglomerate. 
There's a close-up from the Old South Church in Boston. And here's a polished piece from the Museum of Science. So you can see all those colorful pieces. You cut and you polish it. Each one of these is a rock that tumbled down a stream, but not too far. You see there's a fair amount of angularity that you see in these rocks. It didn't go too far from the mountains before it got dumped into an old uh, rift valley, as we would call it, uh, on the Gondwana continent. Back in the Precambrian, 600 million years old. Okay, so to go over the origin with you, the origin, a section of Gondwana kind of stretched and created a rift valley. The valley filled with gravel from nearby mountains. And this, of course, I wanted to tell you, remember Gondwana. And then uh, Wellesley split off as part of that Avalon terrain, terrain and then crashed into North America. Oops. So anyway, the, this rift valley filled in with gravel from the nearby mountains, and eventually that conglomerate collided with North America, and today that Avalon terrain can be found all the way along the East Coast and up through Canada. Uh, most of Connecticut is Avalon, see, so, and it goes over to Scotland, so uh, it, it's a big terrain, and you're part of it. Wow, doesn't that make you feel good? You never knew that, did you? You go visit your friends in Scotland. You're on the same rock. <laughs> okay, so there you are, Wellesley in New England on Avalon, an exotic terrain. And now, let's take a look at a geologist at lunch. He says, I'd like the tectonic plate. Very good, sir. That'll take a while to get here. And now we're going to jump up to the Ice Age. We're going through geological time pretty quickly. Yes, we'll get out of here by 9 o'clock. Oh, no, no, we'll get out before then. But the Ice Age and Wellesley. So the last Ice Age was at its maximum only 20,000 years ago. Gee, that was just a quick step back into geological time. This is a, what we call a surficial geology map. So the bedrock is ignored. It's just down below there. But it's covered by these glacial deposits and uh, meltwater. Uh, as the ice is melting, you get meltwater. So there's meltwater, sands, and gravels, and a few lakes as well. So just to show you what this is here, where you see the pink, those are old lake beds. And where you see the, these little green uh, elliptical shapes here, some of you probably know those drumlins. They're called drumlins. These are glacial till, that's glacial gravels, gravel, sand, mud, deposited underneath the glacier. Then as the glacier moves over that deposit, it will shape it in um, a hydrodynamic form elliptical form, and that's what you see there. Piles of glacial till, stony glacial till, shaped by the overriding ice. Notice how they're lined up in this direction because that's how the ice went. You know, it kind of streaks them out into that direction. And then we have uh, kettle holes that were melted out ice blocks. And a, a lot of outwash, so there's a lot of gravel through here from the ice that was there melting and uh, meltwater streams going out. How would you like to see a picture of Wellesley back in the Ice Age? <laughs> yeah, well, I would too, but I haven't found that. <laughs> but I went to Iceland, and you know, you can make a lot of comparisons from Iceland. They got a lot of ice in Iceland, but it's not like Greenland. Yeah, Iceland really is green and Greenland is ice. You probably have heard that before. But in any event, here's a major glacial area uh, it's the Skaftafell National Park in Iceland. So we're, we're up on a high ridge here looking down on the glacier. It's spilling off the higher area. And then it's moving down to the right. So the ice is moving down. Now, this is what Wellesley would look like without all the high peaks, of course. You'd just be this pile of ice uh, coating the flatland. And look what you see if you look a little further to the right. There's lakes because as the ice drops its materials, there's all sorts of blockage to drainages. So there's all sorts of lakes that form as glaciers melt away. Very common landscape form. Sometimes ice blocks get buried and they will eventually melt out. That's going to give you your kettle holes. So as you look across this landscape, you see blockages. Um, there's your lakes that are going to be very muddy. See how muddy that looks, perhaps, even from this vantage point. Streams that snake their way across, braiding their way out to the ocean way off in the distance to the right. And so this is the landscape of Wellesley 
when it was really, really new, when the ice was just there melting away. And so that's what created this, lots of outwash, drumlins, glacial till, and lakes. So let's take a look if you are standing here at the library looking across Wellesley 16,000 years ago. Make sure you have your jacket and a few layers on underneath. There's your lake that's right out here in parts of Wellesley. There's the ice off in the distance. Oh, look, there's a commercial boat operator that would come by. <laughs> and further in the distance, there's a rock. There's a dark spot that you notice on the ice. Now, when the ice melts away, that rock, which is the size of a small car is going to <laughs> become the problem rock. <laughs> now the problem rock I guess is a problem and people from uh, the town can tell me for sure, but it is right, it's a big rock and it's at, at an intersection, a rather dangerous intersection. And um, is, that the, is that what they call it, problem? Can someone elucidate that? Yeah, right, right, so it was there, <laughs> so, but they, they didn't move it, they put the road around it, and I, uh, from what I read, uh, the road was dangerous, so they made it a one-way road instead of a two-way road, and that kind of solved the problem, didn't it? But anyway, it's called the, a problem rock, it is Roxbury conglomerate, it's a glacial erratic, so it was brought by the ice from not too far away, and then dropped <coughs> and it even has its own plaque. So when you read the plaque, it says Roxbury conglomerate of the Permian period over 200 million years old. Oh no, that's wrong. <laughs> it's not Permian, Permian is late Paleozoic. This is 600 million years old. It's Precambrian, it's late Precambrian. So anyway, it's even more impressive in age than the sign says. <coughs> it's a problem sign, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is split Pangaea. So here we go, let's move on and split Pangaea. If you go back to the Paleozoic era, that's when Pangaea is formed and the Appalachian Mountains are made, but when we go to the Mesozoic era, about 250 or so million years ago, Pangaea is going to break, because you all know, you've seen the new maps, we don't have Pangaea anymore. There's the Atlantic Ocean in between. So we're gonna create the Atlantic Ocean. Now when that happens, the landscape starts to crack, because when you spread a continent, when you break a continent, all sorts of earthquakes develop, and that stretching stress creates what we call rift valleys. So if you remember everything I've said, and I'm sure you do, Roxbury conglomerate formed in a rift valley in the late Precambrian way back in Gondwana. Now, fast forward here to 200 million years ago, Pangaea is splitting, and the Connecticut River Valley is beginning its history along a fault line that is a rift valley also. See, we have something in common between eastern and western Massachusetts. So, I want you to wake up for this part because it's really important. How are you doing back there? Okay, nudge your neighbors. I see one person against the wall. Okay, wake up for this. Okay, so here we go. As you split the continent, there's about oh, probably 30 or 40 major fault lines up and down the east coast from Nova Scotia all the way down to Florida that represent this cracking, because the, the whole continent's cracking and creating these rift valleys. So the rift valley has a major fault here in the Connecticut River Valley. It's on the east side, so we call it the eastern border fault. And it forms this whole lowland that you can kind of see circled if you were to look at a picture of this, we have the central New England highlands that are sticking up. The fault would be right along the base of those hills. Rivers would have come into the valley and brought alluvial fan gravels, which is pudding stone, which is what would be our pudding stone today, and then shorelines and lake beds further out in the valley. If you've been to Death Valley, you have seen a rift valley. In fact, all the way from Salt Lake City to the Sierras of California. Rift after rift after rift after rift. It's called the Basin and Range, right? Ranges are the uplifted parts, the basins are the downdrop parts. And that's all because 
everything to the west of Salt Lake City is stretching apart. The ocean is coming in there, folks. You can't doubt that because if you go to Palm Springs, it's below sea level there south of Palm Springs. There's the Salton Sea already. If you go to Death Valley, you're 300 feet below sea level there. You see, we're just waiting for a little more earthquake motion to spread that land apart, and the Gulf of California is gonna squeeze right in past Mexico there, past Baja, and this will be shorefront property. And so, <laughs> this is your time to invest. <laughs> In any event, look at what we have here. Look at the pattern of a rift valley. There are the mountains. There's the fault. Here's the valley. Uh, the allu alluvial fans as the rivers wash off and bring the gravel into the valley. So when you look at the Connecticut Valley today, we find pudding stone just like this. That's the alluvial fans. We find sand from the old shorelines, and we find muddy rocks, shales, with mud cracks and even raindrop impressions sometimes. How about that? It rained 200 million years ago, and the impact of the raindrop is preserved in the surface layer of what's now a rock. This is not all that uncommon, by the way, just to let you know. This is not really rare. You can find these things, perhaps not quite as good as you're seeing here in the slide, but it's not rare. But dinosaurs walked through those muddy areas as well. They left their dinosaur footprints. This is a rare one that dropped a pocket knife. You can see that here. <laughs> okay, this gives uh, rise to my theory that dinosaurs were actually marsupials because where would you keep a pocket knife? <laughs> you know? Um, now, Rocky Hill, Connecticut has Dinosaur State Park. Maybe you've been there to Dinosaur State Park. That is a great place to go. And closer to home is the Bineski Museum at Amherst College, just to let you know of a place to go. A free museum with incredible dinosaur footprints on display, best in the world, right there in Amherst. But where did the study of dinosaur footprints begin? I bet nobody knows the answer to this. The study of dinosaur footprints began in Greenfield. See, I taught at Greenfield Community College. We take our fame anywhere we can get it. <laughs> but it was 1835, and they were laying flagstones on the streets of Greenfield, and these incredible prints were being laid on the streets. And this was the first time that they were actually brought to the scientific study of Dr. Edward Hitchcock, who spent his career trying to convince people that indeed these were real, not just sports of nature or something like that. So um, we think that most of these footprints were made by Dilophosaurus. That's, uh, we don't have the bones in the footprint, however. See, we got the footprint, and then in other places, not too often in the Connecticut Valley, but other places in the world you find bones, but you don't have the print. So to identify the maker of the print, you have to go to the anatomy of the foot bones and try to see what fits. So it's, it's guesswork. So there are names for the prints, and there are names for the bones, which relate to the animals, but they're two different uh, classification schemes. So the prints and the bones are named differently. What if dinosaurs were still alive? What do you think about that? Forget going to see the elephants. Look at those big herbivores that are off in the distance, 10 times bigger. And what about those footprints? Do they tell us something about the social life of the valley dinosaurs? Okay, so Connecticut Valley fossils, lots of them. You hear about the footprints, there's reptiles, amphibians, there's fish, clams, crustaceans, burrowing insects, lots of plants. It's a whole functioning ecosystem. Now, one of my students way back a while ago was a pathologist, and he really got interested in, uh, in rocks. And he went to Turnus Falls and started collecting black shales. Now, black shales are old lake bed deposits, and many times they will have fossil fish in them. So he would take layers back to his workshop and carefully uh, split them. And he found the world's only faulted fish. This is absolutely amazing because he found a lot of faulted fish, and let me just put this down for a second. To realize how special this is, you have the fault, and it's exactly lateral motion. If there was a little bit of up or down on the flow of the fault, when you split the layer, the head and the tail would not be on the same flap. Mm. So he found a number of ones that had been faulted, but as I said, they weren't on the same cut. 
thing split, and so therefore they didn't have control. But there was only one that drilled this. It's now at the Amherst College Museum. It's really rare. No one that has ever seen this picture has ever said that there was another one that was there in the same place. It's really unique. And so I take, I take partial credit because this was Harry Sharbo. He was in my class. He learned geology. <laughs> Uh, this is the original fish fillet, by the way. <laughs> and now I've got to tell you about armored mud balls. Okay, I know this is a detail that you never even heard about before you came in here, but armored mud balls are my claim to fame in geology, and by God, you're not leaving here without learning about them. <laughs> so here they are. What are armored mud balls? Okay, first of all, Hard, dry mud falls into one of those Mesozoic streams, and it tumbles down the stream, and as it does so, it gets round and soft and sticky on the outside as it continues to roll pebbles from the stream bed, stick into the ball, and that's what we call the armor. So these are armored mud balls. Here's what they look like. When I first came to the Connecticut Valley, decades ago now, I was just looking around and I went to the Connecticut River where there was a park and I saw this rock. I put the six inch ruler there just for the picture. But look at those round things. Wouldn't you stop and look at those? I mean, they're really interesting and they're obvious and they're just intriguing. And so the rock itself is an old stream deposit. You can see the pebbles. That's mud, kind of a sandy mud, and there are the pebbles just stuck. That's the armor. So there's one there, one there, one there. Those are armored mud balls. Here's a close-up. I put the dime there for scale. Boy, I wish I found a dime in one. <laughs> Boy, that would date it, 1938. <laughs> wow. So humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. I'd be a creationist, um, uh, gee, I would, I would be really famous, that's for sure. Okay, uh, anyway, my, <laughs> my student who's the cartoonist said that, okay, the way I described was not the correct origin. They were mean dinosaurs, they were making armored mud balls and bullying the little ones, that's what happened. Now, the armored mud balls I found are lithified, they're turned to stone. There are armored mud balls that are recent, that wash out from time to time thanks to floods. Here's a, a classic picture in a geology book from the 1940s, or an article actually on armored mud balls back in California. But a friend of mine who's an artist, his name is Will Sillen, he goes out to the west and he takes pictures and then he comes back to his studio and he paints from his landscape pictures. He went to Factory Butte, Utah. How many of us have been to Factory Butte? Okay. <laughs> Look what he saw right along the trail. A whole bunch of armored mud balls. They are about 12 inches. Look at that, rolled right out there. And of course the mud is part of this mud flow. It's all drying up. You see the mud cracks. But he just couldn't believe it, and he actually thanked me. He said, you know, if it wasn't for me, he probably would have just kicked those and walked on, but those are armored mud balls. So that was amazing. And then, even more amazing, I know, this is getting really boring, but <laughs> even more amazing to me is, you know, I lead these tours, and we were just south of uh, Carlsbad Caverns at Guadalupe Mountain National Park in West Texas. They had a flood. All those limestone blocks washed out of the adjacent uh, mountains and went over bank as part of a flood that happened about six months before we were there. So in looking at this flood deposit, you see that thing over there? That's an armored mud ball. There was only one. I couldn't believe it. How could all that energy come down this stream with all those blocks of limestone and yet somewhere there was mud upstream and it got coated as you see it. There was one armored mud ball. I rushed in to tell the staff. <laughs> <laughs> I went back a year later. See, this is really interesting, isn't it? I went back a year later, followed the same nature center path, which was right near where the nature center was, and that's what it looks like a year later. See, so we're not going to see it anymore, I don't think, but uh, there it was. I mean, I found an armored mud ball right beside the nature trail, and nobody cared except me. <laughs> oh, I know, it's a sad story. 
Okay, but armored mud balls need quick burial before they dry and disintegrate. And there's a historic picture of me beside the Connecticut River looking at armored mud balls. And look at them, they're in these, these quarried rocks. The quarried rocks were from a nearby quarry from uh, a few hundred yards away. And the reason why they're quarried is because this was part of a suspension cable bridge that went across the Connecticut River from a place called Gill to Turner's Falls. The bridge is now taken down, but each one of those cables had to come into a big anchor. And that's the anchor. So when I was there back in 1969, um, I wasn't quite aware of what it was, but uh, that's the anchor of the old bridge, and I found armored mud balls, and I became, once again, rich and famous. <laughs> so, I got the town of Turner's Falls to take down that bridge uh, abutment anchor there, and we moved the armored mud balls to a more secure location, and they're now along a path. We have a new geopath at Greenfield Community College, and there's a whole section right over there that would be those armored mud balls and a lot of other interesting rocks from the valley. Now, just in case you want to take the 100-mile drive to Greenfield and come to our Gem and Mineral Show Saturday, November 9th, you not only can get a free meteorite, but you can get a tour of the geology path and see monumental specimens with armored mud balls. Okay, so back to the story here. So in the Connecticut Valley, Pangaea is splitting. There were lots of lava flows that came out. No big volcanoes, just lots of lava. And the lava comes out over the whole area, and it gets tilted up on edge, kind of like tilting a book, and then erosion gives you that book edge that just sticks up as a ridge. And so that's what you're looking at here off in the distance. It's called the Holyoke Range. And here's a map of Connecticut. And I just put this in to show you that the red line, kind of broken up by faulting here, that's the Holyoke Range lava. And it goes all the way from New Haven all the way through Connecticut up into Massachusetts, and it uh, dies out over in the Amherst area. So it's pretty significant. You know, 400 feet thick, tilted up on edge the Holyoke Range. If you hike up to the cliff, this erosional cliff, you see that there's lots of columns here because when lava flows out, it cools and shrinks, and the shrinkage cracks form these six-sided uh, shapes here, so basalt columns. If you go to Iceland and you witness things like this or see pictures of it, this is what eruptions in the Connecticut Valley would have looked like, because Iceland is also pulling apart, so lots of cracks, lots of lava coming up, flowing out, and this would have been a typical landscape of the Connecticut Valley back 200 million years ago. Okay, are you still awake? We're gonna skip 200 million years to the Ice Age. How am I doing for time? Okay, I have uh, like five minutes or less how are you doing? Can you sit still for five more minutes? Okay. If anybody has to leave, certainly do that. I won't hold it against you. Let's go on here. So we're going to skip 200 mil million years ahead. The last ice age, okay, only 20,000 years ago. When we come to the Connecticut Valley during the last ice age, now you guys in Wellesley, you've got your little lakes here, these little puddles, but we get a 200-mile-long biggest glacial meltwater lake in New England. It's called uh, Lake Hitchcock. Starts in central Connecticut and it goes all the way up into, uh, well, West Burke, Vermont. Been up there, West Burke, Littleton, New Hampshire, way up there. So that's the upper reaches of the lake. So it was a very substantial lake. And that's a map of the lake. Glacial Lake Hitchcock is what it's called. And if you were there to witness it, there was the melting ice, and the lake was right in front of the melting ice, just following the melting ice. The more the ice melted, the longer the lake became. Now, when you have glacial lakes, whether they're big or small, rivers that come into the lake are going to build deltas. And deltas are great flat-topped areas that have airports. So... That's Bradley Airport, that's what that is over there. The Farmington River came out and made a delta into Lake Hitchcock, and there's Bradley Airport. So every large delta has an airport. The Farmington has Bradley, the Chicopee has Westover Air Force Base, the Millers has the Turner's Falls Airport, and White River Junction up there, Hanover. So deltas in Lake Hitchcock, nice, flat, gravelly areas, great place to land a plane on. 
When you look at the structure of a delta, you would find that the river comes into the lake and it builds these flat areas on top called the topset beds. But the parts that are really interesting are the interior ones, the ones that form underwater. And these are st steep delta front deposits. They're called forsets, and they form at an angle and build out underwater. Now, when you go into a gravel pit, see a lot of these are great for gravel resources. So when you go into a gravel pit, you can see these layers sometimes. You have to be lucky to see this, however, because give any gravel pit a couple of weeks and it just slumps down and you don't see the layers that are right underneath. So how many people have been in gravel pits before? Anyone seen those layers? Okay, I also ask how many of you have been in gravel pits in the daytime? <laughs> okay, that gets a laugh. But if you're not in an area with gravel pits, you know, they, they're great party spots, so many people have been in gravel pits at night. <coughs> but in the daytime, look at what we have here. This gravel pit has these tilted layers, and if you know a little bit of geology, you're going to get the story really wrong. You're going to say, oh my gosh, let's see. These are sedimentary. They used to be flat. Earthquakes have tilted them up to where we see them. Okay, that's a great story. But this is original deposition at that angle. So they were deposited that way. So the river's coming out from the right, and it builds, and it builds, and it builds. So it builds these layers out underwater, and as it advances to the left, it builds the top sets further up. So this is not due to earthquakes. So a stream is flowing that way to create those four sets and the top set beds, and the contact between the top set and the four set, that's the old shoreline. So, you know, as the delta builds out, it builds up, and as well as out underwater. And that contact between top set and four set is the old shoreline of the lake. So geologists love to find this, and they bring altimeters in to measure the elevation of the old shoreline as recorded. And so, <laughs> it's very cool. Okay, in conclusion, <laughs> Wellesley, and the Connecticut River Valley both have old rift valleys and we both have pudding stone. I'm feeling very close to you tonight. <laughs> but Wellesley's rock history is mostly blanketed by de deposits here. You know, those glaciers, they came by and they put a blanket of deposits. But w in Western Mass, our hills allow better viewing of our diverse history. So this is, <laughs> Neat, <laughs> but we have the best place in the world to study geology. You got to come on out here and see that. So there's a story in every stone. These wonderful outcrops have just amazing stories in them, and geology rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and what has been seen cannot be unseen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, let me tell you, I am going to be here if you have questions or if you'd like to pick up some of the materials. There is the free handout. That's the timeline of today's talk here, just in case you didn't get one. Okay, thanks again for your rapt attention. Great audience. Come back again the next time I talk.